just normal fr Friday fireside. Uh, and we are live. Uh, and we have oh, a lovely bunch of people from all over the place. Mm. Uh, I don't know if you can recognize any names, uh, Kendra, because I think you had some people, your peoples or your uh, are joining us. So <laughs> yeah. I do. I do. Tula from Finland. Oh, sorry nice. I'm, to, I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. I do recognize her. Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, we have Finland, Switzerland, UK, uh, New England, USA. Where is New England? New England, that's the northern and eastern states of the US. Ah, okay. Yeah, my, my geography is rubbish. Uh, and Balina. Balina in Ireland? Is, how do you pronounce that, Lawrence? You did, oh, it. You, you did it. You did it justice. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Hello, Francis. Great. Um, so, <laughs> quick one before we go off, a little check in. Uh, see how uh, I'd love to hear everyone in the, who's, who's watching live, a quick check in from you. Just type into the chat. How are you feeling this morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are? Um, Lawrence, how about you? How's your day been so far? Good. Sunny. It's very sunny in Brighton. I think we've got a day of sun before the rain arrives tomorrow. So, yeah, it's been nice to enjoy some of that. A nice walk. Um, I am home alone because my wife is away this week. So looking after the kids, luckily they're at school today, but yeah, juggling everything and appreciating all the stuff my wife does that I don't notice until she goes. <laughs> oh my God, when you said home alone, I thought, yay, just you, no, the kids. <laughs> well, they are now until they arrive back <laughs> far too soon. But no, feeling good and excited about this conversation because, um, well, it touches on, as we had a little chat before this, touches on a lot of nerves around. <laughs> Where we're all at in life, <laughs> particularly us who are a bit more forward in life, <laughs> mature, mature, mature. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. Yeah, seasoned, <laughs> wise, <laughs> tired and decrepit. <laughs> Kendra, how are you arriving today? <laughs> pretty good, pretty good. Very excited to be here. It's really cool to see all the people who've tuned in. So, hi everyone. Yeah, no, it's really early morning where you are, right? It's like seven. Very yeah, early morning. It's about seven a.m. <laughs> so. yeah, we are very grateful for for your for your time so early in the morning. But um, well, I feel, I feel there's a lot of energy to that um we can generate today. With lots of interesting discussion, and I'm excited about this. Like Lawrence, you know, I'm in Brighton as well. Beautiful sunny day. I'm due to go camping with my daughter this afternoon. Mm, so nice. um, very nice. Yeah, I'm just I'm a bit of a control freak. And so I'm kind of sweating and stressing about have I got everything? Do I have milk? Do I have camping pegs? And I won't have time to really prepare. So it's going to be a real exercise of letting go. Yeah. Just yeah. hoping it doesn't rain. <laughs> you do one of those time lapses where you, you like fail to put up the tent properly. And, you know, and it's just like <laughs> getting really annoyed with you. That would be too embarrassing. And I think my daughter would just get too stressed. Well, luckily, we have one of those tents. You just like, bloop. Oh, and yeah, it pops yeah. up, so it's all good. The trouble is, it will just blow away if there's any wind. So, um, I grew up camping, so I have lots of happy memories with my parents when I was a kid. Uh, my parents hated camping, they had no interest whatsoever in camping. I think it would be the kind of thing that, and my mum might be listening, so we should be careful, but she'd probably like sweep out the tent every you know, 30 minutes to make sure it's really clean and just make sure no no insects inside. Yes, I'm, I'm unlearning. I'm slowly unlearning. And that is part of what we're going to be talking about, I think, um, mm. <clears throat> this unlearning process. So uh, I'm going to do a quick intro, and then we will kick off with uh, today's Friday Fireside. <sighs> good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome everyone to another Friday Fireside from the Happy Startup School. As always, I'm joined by Lawrence. Hello, Lawrence. Hey, Carlos. And joined by the wonderful Kendra Patterson. Hello, Kendra. Hey. Uh, the title um, of today's pod or podcast show, Friday Fireside, um, is How to Be a Late Bloomer. Um, and so uh, maybe first to begin with a quick definition from you, Kendra from your, your understanding of, of what it is to be a late bloomer, just to give us a bit of context. Well, I think interestingly, being a late bloomer doesn't actually have to do with age because I can remember feeling like a late bloomer when I was like 22 years old, <laughs> which seems kind of ridiculous looking back, but I think it's significant because 
being a late bloomer, I believe, is more about feeling like you maybe don't fit into the mainstream society. So you're kind of not following the roots that you're supposed to follow. And so there's one leg with that. Yeah. In the audio. Should I put my headphones? Yeah, maybe try that. It, okay. it, comes, it, it comes and goes for me. Yeah. Okay. Try the headphones. I, I seem, uh, yeah, there was a, the audio wasn't great. In the meantime, put a little poll uh, up on Crowdcast. Uh, would be curious to hear where, how best you describe yourself. Um, I think it's kind of related to, to this idea of where we need to be and when. Great. Can you hear us, Kendra? I can. Great. Brilliant. Okay. That might help. Awesome. So just to, to briefly conclude what I was saying, I think that being a late bloomer is that feeling of just being a little bit out of step with the mainstream culture. And that causes you to feel like you're behind. Cool. Yeah, and I, I definitely um, relate to that, particularly when kind of, it's that whole thing measuring yourself up against a yardstick that might not be the best yardstick to measure. Right, right, exactly. So you kind of have to find your own yardstick you have to create it for yourself and that takes a really long time especially if you remain caught up for a really long time in your life on the standard measurements that we use to judge value to judge success and having a like arrived arrival mm. what's, your, what's your take on late blooming lawrence well when kendra was talking i i thought that too like i remember vividly being about 23 in an office job at the time feeling like I don't belong here. Like I, I can see my life fast forward 20 years being the same, just maybe nicer clothes <laughs> and, and a nicer desk and a nicer office. So I remember thinking then like, yeah, I, I feel like I'm having a midlife crisis at 23. <laughs> Quarter life crisis. And yeah, I have heard one of, of those too. Yeah, I've heard of that book. Um, so yeah, I, I like you. I like the idea of it, not just necessarily as a stage of life or not as a, a time of life but more of like when it happens to you a kind of uh almost like a world view of do i belong here i was very affected by the a bit by school about like all right what is it what is it you're gonna do with the rest of your life and the whole kind of career well in the uk at least the careers advice approach where you kind of fill in some form or answer some questions and suddenly they tell you okay this is what you should be doing and then that whole thing of if I a I didn't like any of the options. One what were them, they? I'm curious to know what it was. <laughs> so civil engineer, which okay, my mom was a civil engineer, and maybe I was kind of influenced by that. But the other one was actuary. Has anybody ever heard of an actuary? I don't know. Yeah, you do I economics. No you can describe, describe what an actuary is, can you? Bet you just sit in a dark room with lots of numbers on the computer. <laughs> Essentially, that's what it is. It's like it's like just crunching risk, basically, mm. basically doing doing basically creating formulas so you know who to give insurance to. Mm. That just that, sounds thrilling. Really, that didn't inspire me whatsoever, and and that really kind of I lost faith in in those kind of like indicators of where I should go next. And then that's destabilizing. Like, what do I do next? And who's updating the lists of jobs? You know, well, and how how recent was that updated? Uh, I, I think it must have been a 20, 30 year old list, that list, because the, the way that it was presented was not fun. Um, but yeah, so there, there's this thing about, I uh, thought for me, it's like, oh, that's the path you should be following. You should be at this, hit this milestone at this stage and this milestone at that stage, and, and not really liking any of the milestones whatsoever, and then getting lost with that. Um, so, what would be, I think, for those uh, who are listening who haven't uh, met you before uh, or don't know your work, it would be nice to get. Uh, sort of like a bit of a summary of where you are at the moment uh, and then uh, a little potted history of how you got here. Sure. Well, the current iteration of my life, <laughs> I like to see myself as a repeat bloomer, actually. But I'm a writer and a podcaster and a creativity researcher. My background is academic. So I went to get a PhD in political science of all things. <laughs> I had been working in DC prior to getting a PhD at a think tank and that kind of led into the political science PhD. But during the course of getting the PhD, I experienced a really, really severe burnout, uh, which was like, 
I thought at the time I just had really bad depression. And I never really recovered from that when I was doing my PhD and in the immediate aftermath. And it really changed the course of my life because I wasn't able to actually continue in academia. I wasn't able to go back to Washington DC to work there. It was like everything just kind of stopped for me. And I knew that I had to find something different because what I was doing wasn't working. It never had worked. So it was kind of, it didn't work and it didn't work and it didn't work. And then I kind of went like and fell off the cliff. So. Hmm. And then what got you, um, was there a turning point? Was it, what, what helped you? I assume you're, you, you climbed back up the cliff a little bit now. Um, oh yes, I am totally recovered now. And, uh, and I'm just, and that journey of like, there's some, it sounds like a real descent into, to, yeah. Lack of hope. I don't know. Lack of joy, lack of not knowing where to go. How yeah. do you get yourself turning around that situation? Yeah, It was like a dark night of the soul is how I describe it now. Not so much, I don't call it depression any longer. I do identify it as burnout. And the reason is because none of the conventional uh, treatments for depression worked for me. And I finally realized, you know what, wait, this isn't that something's wrong with me. It's not about a chemical imbalance. It's that I've been living my life the wrong way. And it wasn't my fault. I was just trying to live life the way you're supposed to and do the, all the things right and all that. But for whatever reason, the type of person I am and probably having to do with being a very uh, creative type, that wasn't working for me. So what was your question? <laughs> How I think uh, uh, Angela's actually kind of articulated what helps you get some orientation. What back? helps me? So honestly, what really helped me was realizing that I had to give up on what I was trying to do with my mm. life pri previously. Mm. I had to decide, okay, well, I'm not going to have a big time job. I'm not going to have a steady salary. Maybe. I mean, honestly, I had no vision for the future. It was a really odd feeling of just having no idea what comes next, but I knew that I had to stop doing everything mm -hmm. that I had been doing up to that point and really like make a shift, not just a shift, but like a total, total change. And I gave myself a lot of time I fortunately had some freelance work that I just continued on with for, you know, for supporting myself. And I was really, really patient with myself. And I worked a lot on accepting that I wasn't going to have things in my life that my peers have. And I, was, I wasn't going to have the things that usually people look at and say, oh, that person made it. They're a success. And that was really hard to kind of give up on those things that give us the esteem of other people. Mm. So mm. it was just a lot of psychological work, really. And I started writing, which has always been my thing. So I bought a domain. I started a blog. Uh, it started as a travel blog, <laughs> weirdly enough. But rather fortunately, I didn't continue in that vein because then 2020 arrived and that mm -hmm. would have just been a disaster. But it eventually kind of turned into this blog where I was talking about my burnout, you know, and all of the stuff that we're talking about today and it kind of went from there. So mm. um, I, I just when you were talking, I, Anya shared something, said comparison is the thief of joy. Which I thought so was so <laughs> true. And I, that was always such a hard thing for me. You know, maybe everyone struggles with this, but I really, I guess in a way that I was raised to believe that I was going to have this really big deal career of some kind, you know. And then I went and got the PhD, and I'm like, well, I have to use this, obviously. Of course, obviously, you have to use a PhD. Otherwise, you've wasted all that time, those resources. It took me eight years to get my PhD. So to be at the end of that and to be like, well, I, I can't continue, I felt like the biggest failure and the biggest loser ever in the history of the world. But now I feel like my life is fulfilling, and really it was because I decided to start listening to what life was telling me rather than trying to tell life what it needed to be. Ooh. Um, the whole comparison piece resonates a lot in terms of comparing yourself to peers. 
and I think um, I know I speak a little bit for Lawrence, when, but I let him as well say his piece. But for me, is that when you get to certain ages, that there's this like I don't know this 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 cultural norm. It feels like you should have this and you should have that, and you should you know there's certain things that you need to have accumulated nearly at different stages in order for you to have been successful in life. And, uh, and you know, both myself and Lawrence are approaching 50 now. <laughs> thing is, I look it. <laughs> Carlos is getting younger. I think it's like, yeah, I'm doing the Benjamin Button at the moment. Uh, as A.G. Han, our good friend from Japan said, Asian discount. So we get, I think, 20% <laughs> off any age people give us. But, um, <laughs> But it's that sense. It's like you know, you. I always thought when I'm a certain age, I should have achieved certain things or done certain things or uh, right. or earned a certain amount of money. Uh, and oh, letting other, go of that is hard. The, the other aspect of it feels like the sunk cost bias of spending eight years studying something and then feeling like I need to pay back that effort in some way, or maybe it's the commitment to others who've expected you to deliver on that journey so yeah that that feels hard yeah the sunk cost thing and but actually i have sunk costs to thank actually for finishing my phd because <laughs> maybe a wiser person would have quit the phd because i knew halfway through um this isn't working for me you know so that was another four years of just uh, like just i mean the struggle it's it's even hard to describe you know in words how hard that was to finish mm -hmm. that thing but i knew that not finishing it would feel worse to me so and that was absolutely 100 sunk costs all the way so i'm the right. only non-doctor on this uh, panel <laughs> oh that's right i forgot you also have a i'm in a phd sandwich, <laughs> PhD sandwich. <laughs> i i would i can relate to the whole sunk cost thing in terms of you know particularly my when my parents asking oh you spent all this time studying what are you going to do with it and it's like actually in my head is like well i did it because it was fun <laughs> it was interesting at mm -hmm. the time mm -hmm. it puts off work yeah it was it was an excuse to not do work but then trying to say all right i've got this what can i do with it again that i found that really hard because i, I didn't start it because i wanted to well, I thought I was going to be a scientist, but actually, if, you, if you're not a scientist with a physics PhD, you're probably in a hedge fund or an actuary. <laughs> <laughs> and that, and the, again, that didn't appeal. But then that whole thing, like, oh, it should all make sense. If you do this, then you do this next, and you do that next. And it's like that, that was challenging. Mm. I'm curious before that. So it felt like before the burnout and the PhD, there was like a trajectory that you saw yourself on. And maybe talk a bit about that. I actually never really had a trajectory that was heading towards a specific goal. I had a lot of assumptions about, about what my life would look like or what it should like look like. But like I changed my major in college like probably three or four times. I switched schools. I decided I wanted to go live overseas. And then I did that for most of my late teens and 20s up until mid 20s i lived in other countries and did my undergrad and master's degree and i lived in china japan australia so that was my life for a long time wow. so then i came back to the states and i had my quarter life crisis and i was like what do i do with all of this stuff i finally found an internship at like age 29 in washington dc at a think tank because i'm like well <sighs> trying to find a job in DC is really competitive, but I'm willing to go there and be an intern at my, talk about being a late bloomer at age 29. I mean, the other interns were like 20, you know? <laughs> uh, so I got that and then they ended up hiring me at the think tank and I worked there for two years. And um, that's kind of what led into the PhD. So looking back, it looks like I had a trajectory, but honestly at no time did I ever feel like I knew what I was doing or had a, a dream or a goal that it was headed towards. I'm an experimental type of person, basically. I'd like to touch on that, actually, um, that idea of the, you, you, I think you said in, in one of your blog posts, the conceptual versus the experimental creative. Uh, Mark uh, had a quick question, actually. Um, he says, does the PhD add value to what you are doing now? 
Thank you for asking that. It really, really does. But it's taken me a long time to be able to see how it fits into and informs my current work. Because what I'm doing now, I mean, my PhD was in basically international relations and international water politics. <clears throat> so ostensibly, it seems to have nothing to do whatsoever with what I'm doing. But the themes that I was working with on my PhD do inform the work I'm doing now. So I, I work a lot with identity and that type of stuff. And that's what I looked at with my PhD. But of course, the skills I learned along the way, uh, you learn to be a professional researcher when you do a PhD. And, you know, that is what I am. I'm a researcher through and through. I'm a scholar. That's just what I am. That's what I do. And certainly, that's what I do now in my work. Cool. I hope that's How about you, Carlos? Way. <laughs> Me? Uh, I can honestly say that there has never been a point in my professional career where I needed to know how lasers interacted with atoms and how that applied. So why do you keep talking about it then? <laughs> but that's the thing. is like from a work perspective, there's no real specific thing that I could say, oh, it adds value. But from a life perspective, uh -huh. it's the things that I've learned and the just the ideas of, you know, this morning we were on a, a group called talking uh, another networking group light-hearted leaders uh, and someone was talking about color and and what color means and so there's a level about color in terms of conceptual and, and cultural and personal perspective perspective but even just this idea like color in itself isn't anything it's just it's just light bouncing off something and some types of light reflected off of it and the stuff that's reflected is the thing that you think is color and even that I think for most people say, oh, okay, that's cool. I start to think about it at the kind of physical physics level, and they say, oh, that makes complete sense to me. And so it's it just opens up a, a way of looking at the world, but has no practical benefit whatsoever. Well, nothing is wasted. Everything is valuable. Yeah. And everything you learn along the way, especially if you're an experimental type of person, funnels into whatever you're doing in the moment. Yeah. And maybe we, that's a, a good segue into this whole idea of, you know, when I was talking before about this kind of trajectory idea, I was re and I'm I was always jealous of people who knew exactly where they're going, what Me they're too. going to do, what are the steps they're going to follow. You know, it felt like okay, I just need to follow this path, and I'll get to where I need to get to. Um, well, some of us like had no idea. It's funny that because I had the complete opposite. Like, <laughs> if someone knew where they were going, I like uh, that terrified me. Bizarre. <laughs> Really? What was that about? about yeah. it? What was it that you didn't like yeah. about? Yeah, that's interesting. I just found it really scary to know where you were going and to be able to predict your life for the next 10, 20 years. That's what actually what got me out of the corporate rat race was that fear of predictability of actually I can see what my life will look like. And maybe because the role models ahead of me weren't people that I looked to and thought that's the life I want. Maybe that was it. But um, just even the idea of, <laughs> oh, there's no... There's no uh, surprise or, or, or delight or serendipity to it. It's this is a path. And so it's just about delivering on that path. So it's interesting. Yeah, you guys really are, both of you, experimental types. And it doesn't surprise me at all, seeing what you do. <coughs> and I, I think I can relate to what Lawrence was saying there. So on one hand, I was, kind, I was jealous, not because I wanted to be a doctor, architect, or lawyer, or actuary, but more those it felt like those are steps you could follow and then around it, you can do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the way Lawrence has put it is like, oh my God, that's your life for the next 30 years. <laughs> There's no yeah. joy or anything else there. <laughs> it's just this job. I identify with both of those, but for me, the problem was that I simply somehow couldn't follow a trajectory. Like I tried mm. <laughs> for decades and I could not make it work. I just couldn't seem to build this progressive life where one thing builds to the next and logically leads to it. And then, you know, you keep going up and up and up. I just, I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. And it wasn't that I wasn't trying. It wasn't that I, I couldn't understand how to do it. It just wasn't how my life was being lived by me, despite myself, <laughs> so. I think this is going to resonate a lot with the people in our community, particularly some in our kind of group coaching programs where there's this 
not knowing exactly where you want to be, but then wanting some kind of plan to get there. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Right. And that's the hard part. <laughs> so when, when you're not, when you don't like to, or when you're not good at creating this end goal and then, you know, doing the steps, because if you can visualize that end goal, you can probably backtrack and figure out where to start. Mm. But if you don't want to, to have that end goal, like you, Lawrence, or like me, you just can't seem to even visualize what the future might look like. How do you get to an unknown, mm. right? Like, how well, do like, you do that? Like you had, you know what you don't want. So you're moving away from something. Right. But, but you're not, not necessarily having, having something pull you, well, not yet, yeah. not having something pull you forward. So I figured out how to do it in my own life, um, but it requires almost like a, a faith in a way. Mm. I hesitate to use the word faith, but that really is what it feels like. You have to trust that the next day or the next moment, whatever it is, is going to bring you the thing that you need. But you have to figure out, like, most people use, like, goalposts or steps to guide them. You have to figure out something different to guide yourself when you're living in this experimental way, is, is uh, how I call it. And for me, my guidepost became, I'm going to do what feels good to me. That mm. had to be my guidepost because mm. of where I had come from. And it's what I suggest to other people, but probably everyone has to kind of figure out like what, what their own guidepost is going to be. Mm. But I only did things that felt good. <laughs> mm. And that's really hard to do because we, we have this idea that things shouldn't always feel good or maybe ever feel good, you know? It, it's kind of this weird thing. And I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm only going to do it if it feels good. I don't mm. care what people say that I'm lazy or I'm a hedonist or whatever, you know, but. So I think maybe to um, give some people as uh, uh, something to hold on to here, because there's this idea of a conceptual versus experimental mm -hmm. entrepreneur, creative person, maybe set the scene there. And then see how you know we can talk more about navigating each path or the ways people navigate each path. Sure. Well, uh, it was actually probably about three, four months ago. I came across a study by a guy named Galenson, and he had done a study on Nobel laureates in economics, and he discovered that there were two different types. One type won the prize for work they did in their twenties, and another type won it for work that they had done in their 50s. So there's a massive difference in age, first of all. And he discovered that these two different types have totally different ways of being creative in their field. The younger type are what he calls conceptual. So basically, they formulate a vision of what they want to accomplish. Um, so they work deductively. They first formulate the vision and they backtrack, they apply that and create steps to get to that preconceived vision. The late bloomers of, of the Nobel laureates were experimental types and they work inductively. They don't necessarily have a very clear picture of where they're headed or any kind of picture. They kind of build their projects incrementally like this, and then they kind of step back and they look at where they are, and maybe they'll go this way, maybe they'll go that way. They actually prefer not to go where, to know where they're going because that hampers their creativity. And understandably, they take a lot longer <laughs> to achieve their uh, prize-winning work because their path kind of looks more like this. But the thing is, is that they enjoy that journey I think it's what you were saying, Lawrence, that you you don't like the feeling, the, the constrained feeling of knowing where you're going. You actually enjoy the journey of getting there. So it's not really about the achievement at the end. It's about the, the living and the experiencing that you do on your way there. Mm -hmm. And making life interesting, I think that's the thing, mm -hmm. is not having the same year again and again and again. Yeah. And it's a certain type of personality. So some people are just conceptual. That's how they like to live. It makes them happy. But the, the problem is, is that we live in societies that are based on conceptual frameworks and ways of thinking and ways of working, goal setting and achievement oriented, you know. And so for those of us who are experimental, we can often feel like we're just doing it wrong. Mm. 
because it takes us longer to get there because when we go into the job interview, we, we are unable to reply when they ask us where we see ourselves in five years, like at every step of the way, we feel like we're just kind of missing it somehow. We're missing the point or we're just not quite getting it. So that's the hard part about being an experimental type. Mm. Oh my God, it reminds me like when we started off in business with the agency, like having consultants or you know advisors say, where do you want to be in 10 years time? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> barely knew what you were going to be in 10 days time, <laughs> 10 years time. Mm -hmm. but exactly. I, I just want to highlight your point about faith because i think it's such an important thing and i don't hear it said very often about like faith it sounds like faith in yourself faith in your ideas faith in following the feeling of what feels good i think that's something that's so important that i i just don't know if i think someone mentioned there about like inner peace and acceptance for me that's tied to it is this feeling of i have everything i need and i yeah. Might might succeed or might not, but if I have faith in myself and not feel like I need all these external things, then mm. I'll, be, I'll be okay, whatever that becomes. And that's, that's a huge yeah. Step. You know, I think that that really hits the nail on the head. I do think it's a it's a faith that you already have what you what you need, um, and I'm I'm starting to realize that more and more. I think as I further along in in my creative business, but originally it started out as a faith that somehow the universe or life or whatever would provide me with the next step when it was time. It sounds kind of esoteric, but that mm. was that was a way for me to sort of let go and let happen in a way. Now I do see it more as having a faith in my inner resources mm. and capacities to uh, survive and thrive just from what I have inside. But yeah. Nice conversation we had recently in our community um we run these little intimate sessions called soul cafe where we just talk about topics that aren't necessarily about business uh and the topic was around surrender and uh, <laughs> and this is i think when you're talking about faith and talking about it will have happen when it needs to happen in a sense uh and acceptance even maybe but this idea we're surrendering to life and and just accepting where it takes us rather than trying to force it to go down a certain path don't know if that's yeah. something that, that yeah might. this is absolutely and i recently read a book by a guy named michael singer called the surrender experiment mm. he's he just his uh he has this temple of the universe thing that's actually right down the road from me so i've actually been to see him live and give live talks uh but that was kind of amazing to read. And I would suggest it if anyone's interested mm. in the idea of surrender and just letting life be what it's going to be. But it is very hard because we like to control things. We live in cultures that are very conceptual and like to control outcomes. And ultimately, we really can't. We try really, really hard mm. <laughs> to control outcomes, but we cannot control negative or positive outcomes. Yeah. Well, there's some things I would like to have control over, uh, a plane arriving at its destination <laughs> or my light switching on in the morning so I can actually use the cooker. Mm -hmm. But I think, and, and uh, you know, my instinctive nature, when I heard this whole idea of like, you know, there's, you, you let go, you can't control everything. No, you got to fucking control stuff. For all. <laughs> <laughs> things don't get done. But yeah. for me, the shift is understanding, yes, there is that level of things need to, the infrastructures, but ultimately particularly when we're thinking about the directions of our lives and what what happens and what we can create or where we can be. I think that for me was the trying to understand it from that perspective. And and there are circumstances that will happen to us that we have no control over. And and if we feel that we can, then that's where we can suffer. Yeah, I mean we live in such <clears throat> control oriented societies that we're able to, like you said, control when the airplane arrives or to, you know, mostly and whether or not the light switches on. But I think that gives us the illusion that we have more power than we really do. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, those are easy things to control. But human beings are so complicated. How, how could we possibly control anything having to do with us, you know? Especially when there's more than one of us <laughs> together. <laughs> just like, when you just start like putting... <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I think that was a, a topic that came up with this idea of parenthood and surrender. Uh, and we're not able to, to control where they're going to go, who they're going to meet, what they're going to become. And at some point, we won't be around even to do that. But we expect that of ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. uh, but this whole um, idea of faith and letting go and, and kind of feeling into what's next, how it sounds like was that always something you would you felt like you could do, or is this something you had to learn? How, how did that evolve? I had, to, I had to learn. I was always aware. So I went to Asia when I was quite young and I studied a lot of Eastern uh, philosophies, religions, Taoism. Buddhism. Um, so I was very aware of these, these ideas of letting go, um, I guess, giving up craving, which is the Buddhist thing. And Taoism is kind of like letting kind of the flow of the universe and work. And, <clears throat> but I'm actually a control freak. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, but often the thing you have to learn is the thing that you are. So, um, I, yeah, I had to learn and it's taken, you know, I'm, I'm in my early 40s now and it's taken up until this point in my life where I felt where to get me to a place where I feel like I'm actually starting to really get it, like what that means. Mm. And again, it really to me goes back to finding that one guidepost for yourself that can lead you to the next step that is something intrinsic, not an extrinsic um, motivator. Mm. And for me, it is that it's got to feel good to me. Hmm. So maybe elaborate. What does that mean to you now? So if you was, what 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 are those guideposts specifically for you? Uh, you mean in terms of the feeling? Yeah. What is it that just to maybe to help people can think about it? What it is for themselves. So I, I, you talked about you 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 love to research. Uh, it sounded like you love to be to learn. I don't know. Is, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so it's not really these the, the activities I do because I have my fingers in a lot of pies and I like to live that way. What it really is for me is that I lived kind of like this for a really long time. Just the feeling of being constrained and it's, it's I guess, anxiety feelings of just being small. And my life did get smaller and smaller and smaller as my depression, my burnout increased because eventually I really wasn't even able to get out of bed. You know, it was, like I said, it was pretty bad. So what I look for now, it could be anything. Like I'm not looking like if, if tomorrow I wake up and my life is like, well, you're done being a researcher <laughs> that no longer feels good. I mean, that's not going to happen, but hypothetically, if that did, I'd be like, okay, I accept that, you know, because what I'm looking for now is this feeling. <sighs> where I can breathe, where I feel like I'm expanding, where I feel like the sun is just shining on my face. You know, that's what I'm looking for. So that's what I mean when I say it has to feel good. It has to bring me that feeling of expansion and almost like a excitement, fun, joy, like all of those mm. things. Like when you're a kid that just kind of that's how you decide what to do in life, right? When you're a kid, it's it's because it just it's the thing that makes you curious and interested in the moment. Mm, yeah. That's what I'm kind of looking for. I'm going to climb a tree now, and mm -hmm. I'm going to jump into a pond. <laughs> I just did that the other day. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Never too old. Oh, uh, how does that? I think Lawrence maybe speaking to that in terms of your experiences also nature and 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 just. Yeah, and climbing trees. <laughs> and climbing trees, doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't climb trees. Um, I was just thinking that I wonder whether it is about maturing, let's say, rather than getting old, but maturing. I certainly feel more in tune to my body and my how, like you said, when you feel good or feel bad, you can really feel it. Not like it's up here, but it's in here. Yes, and so embodied. Yeah. Embodied, yeah. And so it's not a nice to have. It's like foundational to being creative or to feeling full or like you said, having the sun on you. But I also wonder whether being through an experience like you went through with the burnout, whether that um, light bulb moment almost was 
something that made you more in tune to your body because it's so extreme, an extreme reaction to the stress or anxiety you were feeling? Yeah, I think unfortunately I'm just the type of person who needed that kind of extreme experience to knock me sideways and put me on the right path, really. Mm. Like the universe is saying, she's just not getting it. Mm. <laughs> We've been telling her all along, she's just not getting it. <laughs> I yeah. got it now, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no more pain. <laughs> but like you said, it, it just sounded like it was difficult, you know, you're trying the same thing, getting the same results. And it's only when you yes, start yeah, yeah. changes that things start mm. to feel easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the type of insanity they say, you keep doing the same thing, mm -hmm. expecting different results. And yeah. And it's, you know, th the, it makes sense, you know, you know, this isn't working, change. But for some people, that's really hard. Mm -hmm. It was for me too. That's why I needed such an extreme experience. Mm. So I get uh, it. It's it's the hardest thing I've ever had to go through. I mean, obviously. So. But I think it becomes easier when you've, like you said, you've, you've been, you know what it feels like to be through that. So you, you don't want to go down there again. Yeah. Yourself. And something else about it too that I found that's really interesting is the hard part isn't the actually the change it's getting to the place where you make the change the hard mm -hmm. part is in the lead up once you let go and you decide mm -hmm. okay all right I surrender then it gets easy I mean then it's like phew, amazing then you're just coasting along so I promise you that like <laughs> it feels like it's just so hard and it is yeah. but that's you don't have to worry about the stuff that comes after just get yourself there to the change. And then, the, mm. then after the change, it'll take care of itself. It's a commitment, isn't it? I think, I think when you commit to something, like even that small step, I think yeah. you can make it work. Or, or... Yeah, I think a commitment is part of it. I am a commitment phobe. And I think it's, it's kind of Lawrence, what you were saying about how I don't, I don't want my life to always look the same. So I don't want to, I'm, I'm careful about commitment, but it's mm. commitment to myself and to my own fulfillment and happiness, really, mm. which we're, we're not taught how to do that in our cultures. No. You know, it's surprisingly difficult. It sounds yeah. easy when you say it. Oh, just, of course, like, of course, we want to commit to ourselves. Of course, we, don't, we want to live our truths and live in integrity with ourselves. But for some reason, it just seems like the hardest thing to do. I feel the message a lot is commitment to others, whether that's um, commitment to your boss, to your colleagues, to your family, um, or above what you might want to do. Uh, I think there's, the, you know, I, I definitely felt it, and there's a kind of a story around if you can, you know, we're here, we're in it together, so we need to commit to each other. Um, but what I'm I'm trying to understand, or learning slowly myself, is understanding what is the commitment to myself. And how does that um, how does that help rather than feel like you're disconnecting from people because you just want mm. oh, it's all about you rather than actually by thinking about me I am then better with others. Yeah, how can, I had this conversation with someone the other day about it. It can feel selfish to say my needs, you know, putting my needs first, doing what I want to do, changing mm -hmm. my business or work life to do something more meaningful for me, but. I was having this thought that actually it's it's more altruistic to make that change in some way because particularly as a parent or someone who's creating an environment for others to thrive if you don't do that for yourself you're almost like you said sort of closing yourself down you know feeling smaller and so i'm just curious about that how that plays out for yeah. people because it feels indulgent as a particularly as a parent to say right i'm going to do this for me mm. at the cost um, of other people yeah, I mean, as a woman, that's, I think, particularly hard for me because we are socialized, I think, even more so than men to give up our own needs for the sake of others. And I definitely struggled with that in relationships and friendships for a long time. And to be honest, a lot of my path was letting go of relationships and friendships where that was the pattern and it was the reason that the person was with me but <laughs> i did feel colossally selfish you know for a long time what i've discovered though is my life has actually opened up in terms of other people that by being but by living what feels like really selfishly i'm able to 
give myself to other people. And I think that's what people really want. They, they want you, they want who you are. They don't want some facsimile of you that you've created because you're trying to be this thing and meet their needs. And, you know, only truly selfish people would want you to be like that. Mm. People who are living in integrity with themselves, all they want is for you to show up at the table and offer what you have. That's it. And you already have what you have inside. I mean, it's already there. You mm. just have to like learn how to let it out, give it. And that does feel very strange because yeah, it feels selfish. That's what attracted me so much to your work and just listening to your podcast. I kind of binge listened to your to your podcast for a bit because it just felt so honest. <laughs> and it felt yeah. so like this is this is what's going on for me. <laughs> this is what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. And and I feel that we you know, there's some of us who feel like, all right, what's the best thing to say so people will like it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I really, really try to remain focused on what is it I want to say. Mm. Because here's the thing. We can never know how what we say is going to hit. We can't. We can't predict that. We can't know that. People are complicated. There is no way to know how we're going to come across, how they're seeing us, how they're receiving what we're saying. So, so if we try to predict and try, that's manipulative really, right? That's like, I'm trying to make you think certain things about me, or I'm trying to engender a feeling in you, a certain type of thought. I mean, the way that I respect my audience and my listeners is by respecting myself and what my truth is and what I have to say. So, but it is hard. I mean, it it requires a lot of vigilance Mm. to, especially as my podcast is slowly getting more popular and I see my numbers going up. I, it's really easy to fall into that mindset where you're like, I have to give people what they want, (laughs) but there, you know, that there, there lies madness. Basically, Mm. if if you go down that path, if you even let yourself start thinking about that stuff, because then you're going to lose it. People are going to, they're going to know that you're faking it, that you're, you're not telling the truth anymore. They're going to stop listening. Um, on that kind of following your own path, your own energy, your own passions, um, I can remember. I can't remember where you said it. There's something around, but there are gatekeepers in this world. In terms of there's stuff you want to create, and then there are people who actually. I think it's to do with publishing a book, and I just wanted to just. To ref- you know, I know your thoughts around that, or maybe if you can remember that what that topic mm-hmm. was about, where you want to create, but there are people who there who who are who maybe stopping that from getting as far as you'd want it to go. That's how I understood it. Yeah, so there's always people who function as gatekeepers, and the example I used was like, so I want I'm a novelist. That's my first art, my first love, and I was never successful getting anything published, anything at all, let alone a novel. Uh, And it's because there are people who are these gatekeepers and they judge your work and whether or not they want to publish it and fine, you know, that's, that's just the way the publishing industry works. But the thing is, is that you, if you look at those people as the arbiters of your worth and your success and you fail, like I did, where do you go from there? do you stop writing? I mean, I did for a while. I stopped writing. I'm like, maybe I'm not a writer anymore. You know, and this, I was born to be a writer. That's what I do. Um, You have to decide that those people don't matter that. Yeah. I mean, they have, they have the power to decide whether or not I'll be traditionally published, but they don't have the power to decide whether or not my work is worthwhile. And so being the rebel I am, it was, it was more like, I'm like, well, fuck you guys. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to put my own stuff out. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to decide for myself that it's worthy, but you have to do that. You have to do that, especially as a creator, because the path to success in the traditional institutional sense for creators is really narrow. And there are a lot of gatekeepers and a lot of those gatekeepers are people who have succeeded. And then they're the ones who shut the door you know, because they need to protect their territory. Mm. Once you kind of see what's going on there and that it's just arbitrary power. It's, it's, it's not like God ordained these people to decide what is great art. You know, it's just, 
people got together and decided it's arbitrary. It's, it's virtually meaningless. Then you have all the freedom in the world to do what you want with your art. Hmm. Yeah. There are no rules. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Except the ones you set for yourself, but yeah. yeah. Except rule number six. <laughs> rule number What's six. Rule number, rule number I six. I don't know that. Oh, uh, Basically, don't take life too seriously. <laughs> it's the only rule. There are no <laughs> other rules. Oh, I like that. I like that. I have a real problem. I, I come from a place of taking life very seriously. <laughs> I'm better at that now, though. Um, so there's. Uh, I really love this energy and this approach of thinking about um, a more intrinsically motivated uh surrendering path uh where you're kind of following the energy following what feels right and, and we had a little discussion we touched on this before we went live and then there's this idea of building a business around that and the things you know making something in inverted commas sustainable around something like that uh i was wondering if you know maybe touch on that experience and 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 how you're navigating that, and what does that mean? The M word. <laughs> the M word, the money word. Oh, the M, yeah. Uh, so that is the challenge, and I'm at the very beginning of that journey. I have to be honest about it. Um, I'm releasing a podcast episode today, actually, where I talk a lot about the money side of things and my finances, where I get my money, my plans for my business. But I started this business in March 2020, and I explicitly at the beginning said, you know what, I'm not going to think about money in the beginning. And I was able to do this because I did have my, quote, day job of freelance work uh, and that I kept and I'm still doing, and that's where I get the majority of my income. But I knew that if I was doing creative work. I mean, my work comes from in here. It's a creative product. If I were doing that explicitly for money, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be true. It wouldn't be real. But now a year later, I have enough content out there. I understand kind of where I'm going with it and what purpose it serves. I understand a little bit better how it resonates with people. I am starting to think about monetization. And for me, what that looks like is I do creative coaching um, and I'm starting up a Patreon for my podcast. I'm thinking about published uh, content that I could sell, but I have to be honest, this is not my forte. I'm not a business person. I don't ever want to be really quote businessy with this because my primary identity is as a creative person. I, my product is a creative product. So I don't know, like everything else, I'm just like, I, I somehow it'll come together. Um, I live really frugally. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry to say that I don't have any brilliant advice on this one thing. I think, it's, yeah, I know. I think it's really useful just for people to just understand, you know, the, this, is a, this is part of the journey. Um, a quick question then is when you say, I don't want to be businessy, what does that, how would you define that in your world? That to me means following conventional business practices and business advice. So a lot of it has to do with goal setting. I do not set money goals for myself. And I know that that just flies in the face of all business and life wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> but for me, I just, it could be in the future, I get to a place where I'm able to do that, but I have a lot of anxiety tied up with money and that just doesn't work for me. Uh, it also means that I'm not interested in really fast, big growth. I'm interested in growing slowly, organically, and sustainably because what I'm going to rely on in terms of my income is people who actually decide my work is worth giving me money for. It's a very personal one-to-one -one type of financial interaction. So that's based on relationships. And that's what I'm really trying to focus on is gaining the trust of my listeners for my podcast and building a sustained listener base. So that's basically my business ideas in a nutshell. 
relationship-based and mm. long-term slow growth and these one -to -one, the one-to-one -one personal interaction and transaction. I believe it's called Emergent Strategy. Really? <laughs> Which there's a book called that. I haven't read it, but Ooh, I've, I've, I've latched onto it as my business approach as well. And I think, but, honestly, I think more and more businesses are going yeah. to be doing it this way because we have enough products, we have enough businessy business. Mm -hmm. And what people are really craving right now is that that personal feeling of meaningfulness, right? Mm -hmm. There's um, the whole, uh, I think, well, we've been influenced over the past decade or so by the startup world and the whole hockey stick growth scale at all costs approach to business and that, that they're finding success and I, when you were talking about relationships it reminds me of um something that lana one of uh, our coaches on our program said moving at the speed of trust yes and i think a business plan that has figures over a five-year schedule it's about you know how can you predict revenues i think what you're talking to there in terms of relationships how do you predict when someone trusts you how do you protect when you get enough people trust you? And then the thing you can, but you can only just turn up, like you're saying, doing your thing, speaking well, the, right, your truth. the right people as well. And when, yeah, when will the right people see you? And I think there's a there's an obsession with growth hacking and trying to you know push up the numbers really quickly by doing whatever psychological trickery you can. But um, yeah, and that's what I'm hearing is like that fault, but that just feels so empty. Yeah, it's 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 awful. I just have to roll my eyes when I hear stuff like that, you know, growth hacking and all that stuff. It's, mm. you know, look, if that works for you, great. Does not work for me. It's not my thing. It feels to me like the Patreon model would work well for you. I think yeah. in terms of how can you get paid just to do what you do without, yeah. without compromise? Yeah. I'm just, uh, I just debuted it and well, actually, um, I'm going to debut an extra content Patreon in June or July, but, I set up a basic tier Patreon for the work I'm already doing for people mm -hmm. who want to support that. I mean, but my podcast will continue to be free and all of that stuff. So, cool. Yeah. Uh, so, just to f before we finish off, if you have any questions for Kendra um, about you know what we talked about late blooming or this whole creative uh, approach. Um, then please post them into the chat or post them into the questions. We're happy to take a couple of questions before we close off. Uh, Sophie was asking, well, she's something around a question about tackling anxiety around money. Right. Hard. Um, it's really hard. Yeah. And it's something yeah. that we've been curious about recently. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I, I grew up in a family that really, it, one of my parents grew up very, very poor and instilled in me a lot of scarcity mindset, money, anxiety about spending money. How do I tackle that? I mean, I hate to say it, but right now, like I said, I've kind of had to put money to the side. That's how I generally tackle things. If something is stressing me out to the max, I just decide you know, I'm not going to deal with that right now. There will come a time when I can take maybe a baby step. But I never, never force myself to deal with something, even if I think I should, because obviously, like, I should be thinking about money, I should be being smart about money, but I'm like, I can't. No. I, have a, I have a meter that's really finely tuned to stress of any kind because of my burnout and not wanting to go back there. So anything that get like, kind of triggers that, I'm like, nope, okay, not for now. And I used to feel that way about Twitter, too. I was like, I can't do Twitter, it's awful. And then one day I woke up and I'm like... I could try Twitter. <laughs> and then uh, that was it. That's how I deal with it, really, to be honest. Awesome. Frances asks a question. She says, are your feelings constant or do you ebb and flow in, out, in and out of states of content with all this stuff? That's a really good question. I do maintain an equilibrium, but I am a highly sensitive person so i'm very attuned to my own internal emotional states so yes every day even within the moment it's like this but i work very hard at kind of keeping it around this baseline so i never go here try not to go away up here mm. um but it, uh, it ebbs and flows and it, it has to i think i mean 
you wouldn't want to maintain a constant uh, sameness state really with that that stuff yeah that sounds like flatlining mm. <laughs> Cool. Excellent. Um, before we leave, is there anything that you would like to, or is there any way that you would like to point people to in terms of just finding out more about your work? Or is there anything that's uh, happening that you're launching or doing in the near future that, that you'd love for people to see? Yeah, well, you can visit my writing site. It's KendraPatterson.com. And my podcast, which I launched in December, is called Stepping Off Now. And you can go to steppingoffnow.com or find it wherever you listen to podcasts. And this episode that I'm releasing right after I get off this call, actually, is uh, going to talk about this the money stuff and some of the the monetization ideas that I have and the Patreons that I'm launching. So you can go ahead and listen to that or check the show notes for the, for today's episode for more information about that stuff. And now that you are on Twitter, if people want to reach out to you there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, my, my handle is at Patters Kendra. And I'm also on Instagram at Stepping Off Now. Cool. I think I just posted the wrong link into the chat, so ignore that last one. <laughs> I'm going to get rid of that one. Yeah, no, it's at, at Patters, Kendra. Patters Kendra. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Your time and your, yeah, your wisdom and, and your knowledge and your experiences. I, it feels like it. there's a lot of uh, resonating stuff for people who are listening and thank you everyone for, so. for tuning in for your comments and your question there seems to be a lot of little resources here particularly around money mm -hmm. money magic by deborah price if there was any nominative determinism in the world price on the, as a surname for a money magic book what a great <laughs> one <laughs> brilliant well um have a great weekend Yes. Have a great rest of your Thank you. Friday. Thank you. Thanks <laughs> for getting up so early for us as yeah. well. Oh, this was a pleasure. I really enjoyed it, guys. And it was my first live event, I think. <laughs> but thank you, everybody, for That's tuning great. in. I really appreciate it. Brilliant. You take care, everyone. Until right, next time. Bye-bye. Ciao. All right.